The Price of Fear. Vincent Price presents Edward Woodward and Annette Crosby in To My Dear Dear Saladin by William Ingram. Vincent Price. Hello and welcome. Cats of the family Carnivora, the domestic variety. The ancient Egyptians worshipped them. The Chinese painted and wrote poems about them. In the Middle Ages, they were considered the familiars, the soulmates of witches and sorcerers. Tabbies, Persians, Siamese, Manx. Even the naming of them can usually be guaranteed to cause a feeling of either near worship or positive aversion. But take it from me, the pampered pet is still alive and well and living at... But you don't need me to tell you. I guarantee you won't have to look far. But what happens when the cat beloved outlives its master, mistress? What if instead of being put down, rehoused, arrangements have already been made to allow it to continue its reign in its own familiar surroundings? It can happen. In the story I'm about to tell you, it did. When her great-aunt Hester died, Emily wasn't at all surprised to come into her estate. Not only as nearest living relative, Emily had always been a firm favorite ever since childhood. As for her husband, Freddie, he, not to mention an ever-growing number of creditors, had positively grown to depend on the bequest. <laughs> no, not even Aunt Hester's open hostility was going to keep him away from that will reading. Yeah. <laughs> well, all in order. Oh, well, thank God for that. Please, Freddy. Oh, very much as expected. A few somewhat eccentric charities in which your great aunt's preference for animal as opposed to human society comes well to the fore. The more I see of people, the better I like my dog, eh? <laughs> Freddy. Quite. However, <clears throat> To my much-beloved great-niece, Emily Louisa Stanhope, I do give and bequeath my home, Longbridge Manor, together with contents and the remainder of my estate, real and monetary, whatsoever. Damn good. Congratulations, old girl. But upon the following sole condition. Uh-huh. Here we go. Might have known the old hag would have kept some trick up her sleeve. It stands to reason, doesn't it, eh? Not only right to the end, but beyond. Freddy! I'm sorry, Mr. Forbes. To my dear, dear Saladin. I wish you wouldn't keep going on about it, dear. All right, all right. Matter of fact, we came out of it bloody well. We were all she had. You were all she had. She hated my guts. Oh, I'm sure she didn't. Oh, come off it, love. <laughs> well, I mean, it was mutual. Let's not spill any tears. You hear me down there, you old nutter? Mutual. <laughs> oh, come on, move over, you twit. <coughs> but, I mean, to try and push us off and saddle us with salad in her damn pussycat, I ask you, what a name to give a cross-eyed moggy. What, what, what was it that old codger read out for the rest of its natural life? In the comfort of its present estate, in the style to which it is accustomed. <laughs> oh, bloody cheap doesn't seem much to ask. Not to ask, dear. Demand. I mean, let, let's get the words right. Demand. They were very close. Oh, for God's sake, woman. I mean, how can you get close to a monkey? Will you move over? <laughs> hmm. I mean, you do realise, of course, it as good as stops us putting the place on the market. When do you think we should move in, then? Mm, sooner the better. At least it'll get those damn bailiffs off our backs. For God's sake, get out of the way! <laughs> Emily and Freddy made their move. And the first item from her dead mistress's bedroom window was Saladin. Saladin. But not the pampered Persian that Freddy had expected. Overweight from years of Aunt Hester's chockies, a silver bell on a ribbon around its fat feline neck. Oh, no. Saladin was sleek, alert, watchful. Resourceful, too, in its own right. Freddy? 
Freddy. Yeah. Coffee. Oh, uh, well, great. Uh, put it down anywhere. There's a lot. Right. Oh, that should do it. Oh, is it sugared? What? Oh, yes. Oh, it's good. Mmm. Oh, that's nice. Oh. <laughs> Would you believe it? Twelve tea chests of junk. We haven't even started on the downstairs yet. If it's just junk, I can't see why you're bothering to create it. Uh, oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that some of it might fetch you a bob or two at some local auction. I mean, the magpies still exist. Yes. Oh, come on, I don't go all hearts and flowers on me, love. If you don't like the idea of it earning a few bob, I can always build a ruddy great bonfire. No, but... no, no. But I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll split the proceeds, send a few bob to her favourite charity. What shall it be? Cats and dogs, eh? Or a refuge for disgraced donkeys deep in deepest Devonshire? Eh? <laughs> She'd have liked that. <laughs> That's the ticket. Now, maybe uh, we can't spend the rest of our naturals as a couple of unpaid curators, can we now? No, no, we can't. Ah, of course we can't. Oh, well, can I do anything to help? Uh, yeah, well, let me see. Um, well, we, you, you could you make, a, make a start on that cupboard. If you've got the stomach for it. Oh, all right. Dear Aunt Hester. You're right, of course. She was the most dreadful hoarder. Yeah, regular old magpie. All intact. Things I'd long forgotten about. Like coming face to face with the whole of one's childhood again. Well, I did warn you. You might not have a stomach for it. No, I'm all right. Really, I am. Well, would you believe? There's a little lady I never thought I'd see again. Well, now what? Ah. <laughs> That's pretty. A dancing ballerina. We're privileged. Huh? Oh, a special treat. She only ever came out on high days and holidays. Birthdays, Christmas, you know the kind of thing. First curtsy, you bobbed without falling fat on your backside, eh? Something like that. Nice. Yes. Very nice. It's not your Faberge, of course. Oh, one of the poor thing's hands has gone for a Burton. Still, it's very definitely curiosity value. Oh, no, no, Freddy, no. Anything you like, but please... All right, all right, all right. I mean, if it's that important, yeah. There's no need to blow your top about it. Oh, it's silly, I know, but thanks. Well, except you're not really thanking me at all, are you, eh? Come on. Come on out with it. I do, I don't understand. Oh, no, but I do. I do, though. I do. Too damn true, I do. You've had that keeper of the holy relics expression on your face ever since you set foot through the hallowed portal, so why don't you admit it? Look, all you've got to do is give me the nod. I can have that lot uncrated back exactly where we found them. I mean, it'd be, be, be just like we've never been here. I mean, is that what you want? Is that what you want? You want an honest answer? Uh, yes. I honestly don't know what I want, Freddy, and that's a fact. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh, my God. How oh, the old girl would have loved that, eh? Oh, she's probably up there now rubbing her hands with anticipation. Oh, I can't see why she should be. Well, it's the thin end of the wedge, isn't it? Seeds of discontent and all of her planting. Well, I mean, just look at us. Look at us. We're not inside the place a couple of days. At each other's throats like a couple of banshees. Oh, that's a slight exaggeration. Mm hmm Mind you, I mean, I don't know why it should surprise me. Do you remember the first time you brought me round to meet the great Aunt Hester? Me and me 50 bob off the peg suit. You know, Sunday tea, wasn't it? Silver tea service, lace doilies, paper-thin china, bread and butter to match. An atmosphere you could cut with your silver cake knife. My God, talk about, talk about pre-judgment. She'd made her mind up about me even before the taxi swung into the drive. She was old, set in her ways. And determined to stay that way no matter what it cost. Mind you, mind you got the worst of it. Hovering between us, keeping up the small talk. As though you actually believed any of it was going to make the slightest bit of difference. Oh, I thought it might at the time. Well, it didn't then, and it isn't now. I mean, thanks to her, we're back there again, aren't we? Right back. Choosing time all over again, is it? You know that isn't true. But do I, though? Because she's dead and gone, and you're here. I don't really have any choice, do I, Freddy? <laughs> no, no, you, you poor old thing, I'm afraid you do not. <laughs> now, come on, 
Come on, come on, because if we, we'll never, we'll never get through, right? What next, then? Well, can you hold these, these steps for me? Okay. Okay? All right, there we go. Oh. A portrait? Oh. Oh, oh no, I mean, it's all, it's all right. I mean, just somewhere less conspicuous, you know. But... Well, come on, it is to be our damn bedroom now, you know? Well, I honestly don't think that either of us could stand Aunt Hester staring down at us every time we made for the matrimonial couch, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose we could. No. <laughs> All right, you got it? Yes, up you go. No. Oh. oh, damn. Look, pa pass me the screwdriver, will you? No. Here. Thank you. Right, this should do it. What was that? Saladin. That bloody cat. I thought I said that cat was never to, no, never to come. No, no. Not in the room. On the lawn. Quite still. Just looking up. As though... Oh, how strange. The minute you touched that portrait. Saladin's fall from grace and ultimate exile did not happen overnight. As with all of Freddy's manoeuvrings, a certain subtlety, not to mention a fine sense of cruelty, seemed to be the order of the day. Even to Emily, the cat's original banishment from the bedroom, from the very foot of the bed it had shared over so many years, seemed not only reasonable but desirable. Aunt Hester's absolute attachment to her beloved Saladin was not something she felt obliged to keep up. But exile from the bedroom was only the beginning. Soon the whole of the upper floor was declared out of bounds. The reception rooms came next. Drawing room, dining room, library. Even its favourite conservatory, all denied. As for Saladin... The fall from grace seemed incomprehensible. Its world was coming to an end. Emily. Emily! Mm -hmm. Your coffee's getting cold. Yes, yeah, all right. Well, for God's sake, you've been standing at that window for ages. What the hell are you looking at? Poor old Saladin. He's been sitting there, waiting to be let in ever since I first drew the curtains. Yeah, well, poor old Saladin can just go on waiting. Freddy, could I just... No, for the umpteenth time, no. A cat in the kitchen, it's, it is just not damned hygienic. Well, I suppose it, it just got used to it. Well, then it can get unused to it. But... No, no buts. Besides... You seen the state that thing's let itself get into? It's not altogether his fault. Oh, and who else's fault is it? I should like to know. Eh? It was. Yeah, well, come on, come on. Let's be having it then. It was one of the conditions, Freddy, for our being here at all. The only one, really. Oh, I see. We're back to that again, are we? On my estate. That's what the old battle axe dictated. Well then. But not not in the bedroom, not in the kitchen, not even in that box you managed to smuggle into the old wash house. On the estate, and that's all it said. Right? Freddy, please. But the grounds are all part of the estate, my love. A bush to sleep under, regular diet of field mice. If it hasn't altogether lost the skill, he'll survive. Anyway, even if it doesn't... No, Freddy. No, 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 I know. No, it doesn't bear thinking about, does it? But even if it doesn't survive, well, Auntie Hester is up there already, remember? All ready to welcome her poor little precious to her eternal cat's cradle in the sky. Get on with your coffee. Saladin's inevitable and seemingly final departure occurred some two weeks later. Optimistically, Emily continued to leave her tidbits outside the kitchen door, but they remained untouched. Freddy secretly congratulated himself that the dratted animal had got the message. Eventually, even Emily was forced to accept that the chance of Saladin's ever returning was as remote as it was forlorn. Not even in the grounds anymore. Sorry, what? Saladin. He seems to have disappeared. Oh, so I noticed. Typical, isn't it? Such base ingratitude, eh? <laughs> what do you mean? 
Well, such tempting morsels you've been smuggling out to it, too. <laughs> oh, what pusscat could resist them? Freddy, those scraps I've been putting out, you... You wouldn't deliberately... Doctor them with something nasty from the woodshed, drop of arsenic in its steak tartare, spot a paraquat in its poisson au gratin, eh? Perish the thought. Oh, come on, now, <laughs> really. I mean, I mean it, perish the thought. <laughs> you do promise me. I don't have to, do I? Oh, dear. Oh, God, now what? Well, it's from... Oh, oh well, I, I suppose I've always thought of her as a distant cousin of mine. Yeah, what is it? Another of the Beggle Borrow Brigade? No, no, she's been very ill. Out of hospital now, but was wondering if I'd care to visit her for a few days. Please bring your scrubbing brush and act dog's body for a week or so. Tear it up to hell with her. I'd like to go, Freddy. Oh, come off it. I'd like to go. You'd like to? You'd like to go? And while you're on this errand of mercy, how the hell do you expect me to manage, eh? Well, it'll just be for a few days. Oh, no. No, don't bother. Don't you bother. Just for a few days. Emily really needn't have worried on his behalf. Now, how did the old saying go? When the cat's away... <laughs> and he'd laughed openly and loud at the aptness of his choice. 2007, 2008, 9... Three grand, as per agreement. Oh, uh, plus a percentage of anything over the odds in due course. Oh, yeah. In due course, well, Freddy. In just, due course. Just jogging the memory, old man. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were pleased with that first consignment. Oh, right? prime, Freddy. Prime. Yeah. Well, they should be, old mate. Nothing of the best for dear Aunt Hester. Been in the family for generations, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's probably got the crown jewels in the Ark of the Covenant stashed away in one of those damned attics of hers. Yeah? Uh, all in good time, smiley mate, all in good time. Well, as much as you can let him have, was what the man said. Oh, well, I, I'm, more, I'm more than happy to drink to that. <sighs> Cheers. Well, come on, get it down, you then. Well, well, it's just that it is getting a bit on the late side. Oh, for God's sake, man. Yeah. You've had one eye on that damn front door ever since you set foot inside the thing. Whoa. Well, it was you I was thinking of, oh, mate. Me? <laughs> yeah, well, not that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting your better half, oh, but... Uh... Oh, no, the hell with my better half. I'll tell you something, old son. Because I, I tell her trouble with my better half is that she's so top drawer she doesn't even realise when she's had the furniture cut out from under her. <laughs> you know, do you know, you know, <laughs> you know, when I met her, impoverished but genteel. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you take it from me. They, they're the worst type. They can't afford what they think they're entitled to and they won't put up with what they've got. Mm. I mean, God knows how she'd manage if she didn't have enough ready to set the pace. Oh, and you can certainly set the pace, my old I'll mate. I tell you, <laughs> old son, if it had not been for me, she'd have been... Well, she'd have taken after a dear dead auntie. She'd have put down dust sheets, locked herself away up there in the attics, existed on a diet of baked beans on toast and cold cocoa. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I ought to be making a move now, now Freddy. You do no such thing. You will sit down. I could just sit down. I mean, I invited you here, didn't I? You are my guest. I mean, if her bloody cousin is so important to her that she's got to drop everything and tear off the minute a damn summons drops on the doormat, so what does she expect me to do, eh? Eh? I mean, just sit here playing patience, twiddling me thumbs. Yeah, yeah, you got a point there, Freddy. You're too right, I got a point. Oh, I mean, she, she would like that, smiling. She'd like that. I mean, she'd like to think that I was here on my own, Leo, pining away in solitary, counting the hours to her blessed return. <sighs> yeah. Ah, it's, oh my God, that's dead on cue. Have you noticed, have you noticed ever since you've been here, that damn phone's never stopped ringing? Ring, ring, yeah. ring, ring. I couldn't help wondering. It's only her, mate. It is only her. It's a stop check, old mate, uh... yeah. I mean, can't you just hear her telling that milksop cousin of hers, I'll just give the old scoundrel a ring and check what he's been up to, <laughs> eh? Ring, damn you, go on, ring. The trick is... The trick is, Smiley, is to keep them guessing. Yeah. Must get a bit wary, though. Oh, too bloody true. If it weren't for the fact... 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not forever, is it? I mean, what? nothing goes on forever. Here, yeah, no, Freddy. No, 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 no. Not the way you're thinking, old man. I mean, nothing as crude, nothing, nothing brutal. It's just she's got no staying power. Do you see? First thing I notice about her, along with her very definite worldly prospects, of course, are the old auntie. She knew that too. Now, you see, I have got staying power. And the old lady, she recognised it, Emmy. I mean, that's what we had in common. Still, I mean, as a good book says, everything comes to him who waits. But the Lord helps them who helps themselves, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I've really got to go now, Freddy. Yeah, yeah, well, all right, old son. Uh, wait, not knock the lights off as you leave, Smiley. Oh, matey. Oh, yeah. Ah. Freddy had no idea how long he'd slept. Minutes, hours, it was of no importance. For the present, he was content to lie there. When he finally took in his surroundings, it was to note that Smiley had obviously taken him at his word and found his own way out. A dim light from the hall slanted through the half-open door. It all seemed ordinary enough, and yet... Nothing he could put a name to, an awareness. Even in the first moments between sleeping and waking, an awareness of having been disturbed. Not by someone, something, nothing is obvious, nothing is positive. More like something within himself, part of a dream. And then he heard it. Far off, and yet omnipresent. Not to be denied. You... Who's there? You, you playing games with me, Smiley? Who the hell's there? It's a cellar. From the cellar, Dan Cellar. Who's there? Now come on, who's down there? Light switch. Oh, what the hell is that light switch? Damn fuses again. Candle, 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 candle. Don't want the candle. Where's the matches? Somewhere. Yeah. Much better. Uh, who's there? Who's down there? Saladin? Saladin? Saladin, yes. But hardly recognizable in the flickering candlelight. A shadow of a cat, scrawny, fur matted, nothing of its former self. Only the eyes were the same, watchful, opaque, unflinching. And Freddy was held by those eyes until the cat leapt. The dark, only the dark, until the moon chinks through the slats of the cellar grill. A pale moon, but slanting directly, almost magically, into the furthest corner of the cellar, onto the discarded portrait of Great Aunt Hester, hardly recognizable now. The once haughty features distorted by worm, mildew, damp, and yet... Her eyes. Still there. Oh, God. Jesus. Those green eyes. They're just like... Freddy recognized them for what they were. The eyes were the eyes of Saladin. Watching him from beside the portrait of its dead mistress. Mm. 
then closer, ever closer, until... Months of deprivation had added hunger to the need for vengeance. Oh, there was much to savor, to explore, until finally it was done. It's my fault. I blame myself. Really, Mum? Now, why should you do that? I should have guessed something was the matter, Inspector. Oh? I've been away the best part of a week, nursing a distant cousin. He didn't want me to go, but anyway, I've been ringing here every day, sometimes several times a day. No reply. I even had them check the line. I should have realised then there must be something. I should have realised. Hmm. Before you rang us, did you inquire at his place of work? He... he doesn't have any. Oh? Private means, then? You could say that. I see. Friends? I'm sorry? A particular friend? No. No one that could possibly concern you. You can be that positive? As anyone can be. This place, you see, it's mine. All of it's mine. Freddy enjoyed his comforts. There was too much to lose. Uh -huh. It became an understanding between us, if nothing else. I see. Do you? And yet, not true. Understanding demands some kind of give and take, doesn't it? With Freddy, boy, it always seemed to be one way. Not his fault, and I didn't mind. It was always that way, right from the start. In a perverse way, I suppose I must have got some masochistic pleasure out of it. Was always that way? I'm sorry? You said was always that way. Oh, did I? Yes, I did, didn't I? So I did. I'd better start by checking the house. But I already have done. Oh, just to be sure. Oh! oh. <laughs> and who have we here, eh? <laughs> oh, pussy pussycat. <laughs> Who's a pretty pussy then, eh? <laughs> they did find him, of course, in time. It, it, it wasn't a pretty thing they found. They decided his broken back and long exposure had caused his death. They blamed what was left of the poor fellow on the rats. Then they sealed his coffin to save Emily any further distress. Strangely enough, Emily was over her sudden tragic bereavement even sooner than she'd thought possible. In the few brief moments she ever gave Freddy a thought, she found a strange solace in her great-aunt Hester's portrait, miraculously restored, hanging exactly where it had always hung. But even more particularly, she found comfort in her cat, in the gentle, oh-so-comforting purr of her sleek, fat cat, Saladin. Dear, dear Saladin. That was To My Dear, Dear Saladin, starring Edward Woodward as Freddy and Annette Crosby, Emily, with Steve Hodson, Smiley and the Police Inspector, and Lewis Stringer, the Solicitor. The Price of Fear was presented by Vincent Price, written by William Ingram, and directed by John Dias. <laughs>